a rim, they're going to not have all their accessory muscles that they use to, to breathe with. Um, and so, and most of them will say, they'll look at the FEV1 to see how severe they are. Um, many guidelines that DMEs have now to get ventilators covered um, on COPD will use FEV1 or repeated readmissions. Um, high CO2 is more than 52, that's a lot of them they'll go by to show how severe they are in COPD. Um, but again, they're pr they're, they look at what really, why they have a problem. If we, if our lungs are normal, your diaphragm's gonna look like a dome shape, like a piece of Tupperware upside down. It's very domed. Um, and the air sacs look like a bunch of really tightly knit grapes and really pretty colors. Um, and they're really like a unit. COPD, mostly by smoking, the smoking starts tearing things apart and tears apart those walls of the air sacs. And so instead of these nice little grapes, you have a bunch of saggy raisins hanging there. And the, and, the, and the walls are broken down, which means it takes the circulation too, so you have a lot of dead space. And then everything kind of sags and they have all this air trapped. So their diaphragm, instead of being nice and dome-shaped, now it's already flat and it's already down here. So the brain says, breathe. Well, the diaphragm can't go anywhere. It's already here. So what do they use? They use their accessory muscles. They lean forward and, and try to rib, lift the rib cage up and down to create space. And they work hard in the day. Well, they don't have those accessory muscles when they get to rim. Their diaphragm's left. It doesn't work that well, so they probably don't get to REM sleep. So they work so hard to breathe at night when they should be resting. That's how bilevel or ventilator will do amazing for them at night so they can actually breathe and rest, and then they feel so much better in the day. I worked in pulmonary rehab um, at a hospital, a rehab hospital for a while, and I wish I knew then what I know now because we would have spent more time in looking what happened to them at night. Did an oximetry on them, put O2 on them, um, never did a sleep study, really didn't consent her doing NIV ventilation at night, but I think it would have made a huge difference. Uh, but again, that's because of all the damage to the lungs. The, the old days we used to do, they used to do um, lung resection, or, or they used to lung reduction surgeries, where they cut out a piece of the lung, um, and then it would expand, and they'd feel better at least for about five years. I don't know that they do them anymore, but they used to do them at St. Louis, and we would rehab those patients for like six weeks really hard and then take them in surgery. And surgery did pretty well because now the lungs had a place to expand. But I think it, after five years, I had to do it again. Um, but I, I don't hear too much of it now. Um, and again, kind of what we say, air trapping. Um, they get that diaphragm flattening, that intrinsic peep. They have so much air still in their lungs, that, which just means they've got to work harder to get the air flowing. We, all we do is brain says breathe, the diaphragm drops down, creates a negative pressure, and the air rushes in. They get to suck through that positive pressure to get the air flowing really hard for them and really tires them out. They lose that recoil um, and they get tired. Work of breathing increases. The diaphragm isn't doing most of the work and that's a great muscle, but, but it doesn't work that well. Um, so again, then you guys end up seeing them in the ER possibly because they just got behind the eight ball, can't keep up, muscle fail failure. CO2 gets really high and I know you all have stories and doing blood gases and CO2s are in the hundreds. <laughs> and you're thinking, how's this guy still alive? Or how's he awake? Um, but they get used to it. The body will, will adjust to a lot of that. Um, and, th and it's like a vicious cycle. They hypo hypoventilate during sleep. Um, so they get lower, CO lower O2s, higher CO2s, and the body will adjust to that. Um, it will tolerate higher CO2, CO2s and lower O2s. Um, and again, blunted, and then they have longer periods of breathing bizarrely or not breathing. Um, AVGs are bad in the day, and it's just a continuous circle that gets worse. Um, in, and they're de an OSA patient, if the airway collapses, their O2 goes down, and then they arouse, and the airway opens, and then the O2 goes back up. So you can see them, and it's more sawtooth up and down, up and down. COPD is a little bit different. They probably start low. Then it, they go to sleep and they don't breathe and it goes down. And then they arouse a little bit, but it never makes it up all the way. And so if you were really smart looking at oximetry, you might be able to diagnose, this guy's got OSA, this guy's got COPD. It throws in the a wrench in the works when they have both. But, uh, but they do look differently on the DSATs. Usually um, they're worse. <laughs> well, if you have both, they're definitely worse. But they just stay down so long, much longer. Um, and again, they worsening day, daytime blood gases. Now, and this is actually, if 
you get nothing out of this whole talk. This is huge to understand on how bilevels work, how pressure support works re in relation to COPD. Um, they all look at flow, and so the, the machines have a target, meaning in this case, 25%, uh, and what that's 25% of the flow. The reason they're so comfortable is it looks at the flow, how fast the flow is coming in. When you take a breath, when you <gasps> take a breath, that it's the highest it is at the very beginning. And say it's 100, and this one it's 100. So the machine sees that and goes, oh, I know exhalation should happen when they get to 25% of that number. And that's pretty natural for us. So the guy takes a breath, um, it's 100 liters, 100 liters a minute, and so as the ribs expand and you get resistance and the lungs fill up, the flow diminishes. And so when it gets to 25, it exhales. It goes, okay, that's pretty good. It hits the target. That's good. That works great for us. COPD, it doesn't work so well. They probably don't get to 100, maybe 60, but they, ne and I'll, I would need to redraw this to here, this line, so it should be here. But if you look, their flow doesn't drop that long. They take forever to exhale. So really, this guy's exhaling probably over here on the wall, um, which is way too long for them. They get air trapping, then they have fight with the machine. Um, so the key is, and the point of this is, this was a study just to show these kind of patients, COPD patients, you need to have a machine that you can adjust the cycle sensitivity, or the where that breath ends. That's when they say cycle, that's the breath ending. Um, so, and that's what in our machines you can adjust. In this case, if I saw this, and the guy had a COPD, I would change that cycle sensitivity to 50%. So I'd move that line up here, and then he would exhale probably around here, which would be more normal. So that's huge to get them compliant on the machines and the wearing and get effective therapy. So whether it's a ventilator or a bi-level, you ought to be able to change the cycle sensitivity to actually compensate for their flow rates. Um, so that's that's huge to make them compliant on it. Um, so that's COPD. We're talking neuromuscular. A um, little bit, uh, kind of the same thing. They don't ventilate. Um, here's a sleep study done. Uh, Amanda Piper, that's from Australia. She worked with Colin Sullivan. Did a lot of neuromuscular patient. And this is a sleep study, a few channels. And RT-wise, I quickly look at their respiratory. Here's the airflow. So this is in non-REM. So they're moving air. You can see the breath. But when they get in a rim, it just kind of disappears. <laughs> and so they're going to probably score that as a central because um, they're in rim. They don't have their accessory muscles. Um, so that's kind of the same thing as COPD except different mechanism, but they don't ventilate during rim. Rim's going to be worse. Um, they don't have their accessory muscles. And again, we look at SATs. We look at O2, but if we looked at CO2, that means the CO2 would be rising also. Um, now, central apnea, different thing, um, and this is, this is a typical patient, um, this is a sleep study, um, in the sense of this person was having centrals. And you look real quick, either this was put, put on an ASV machine, but they ran it in CPAP mode. Um, and here, it's just a fixed pressure, and you can see, we used to call this um, for football season, if you back it up, it almost looks like a football. It's very consistent. This is chain stokes that they're having this, <laughs> and then they do nothing. And that's pretty um, obvious to see once you see it. Um, and the SATs are variable, which is when they approved, and I want to say maybe 10 years ago, I'm trying to think of when it was, when they approved this ventilation, ASV, for these heart failure patients or for these central apnea patients. At the original guidelines said they had to desat below 88. Um, and as you see this patient, many times they don't. But, but they go up and down. That can be just as bad, a desaturation and reoxygenating. That can be just as bad as going low. But when it, the guidelines came out for Medicare, we were worried we just had this machine that we can't get covered. Luckily, about April, they changed the guidelines to blow that O2 out. And it, so it was not there. But this is a typical patient. They might not get covered. So this is what they would see on these kind of central apnea patients, and they blow their CO2 down. Um, and we'll see this guy later fixed. And the pulse jumps up and down, too. Um, so again, central apnea is a little bit different, um, more or less the brain's not firing, possibly, or it's too hyper, too. If they're blowing their CO2 down, it causes centrals. Um, but again, if you don't treat these, you're going to have 
risk of other things going, especially cardiovascular. And they're probably not as easy to pick up. OSA, many times patients come in the sleep lab, you'll ask them, why'd you come in for a sleep study? You're just tired? And they go, well, no, my ribs hurt. What? Well, she keeps elbowing me all night to keep breathing. <laughs> so, so that's pretty easy to hear because they, when they wake up, they snore and stuff. And that's central apnea. You may not hear that. They may just quit breathing and start. And the spouse may never know that it happens unless they wake up and they've got a mirror under their nose looking to see. And they, then I suspect something else is going on. I don't know. But, but it's usually not, they don't pick up on it that much. Um, and again, we talked about the guidelines considered to be primary when 50% of the apneas are central. Um, and that's key for getting it covered because if the physician writes OSA is primary, they'll deny it. They need to write central sleep apnea is primary. Um, and, and again, some of these patients, we all have a level of CO2 that the body, the brain says start breathing. It may be different a little bit, but it's not the same. But what happens is the CO2 drops to this level, the brain goes, what are you doing? Quit breathing. And then you start having centrals. And in these kind of patients, it starts cycling. They kind of overshoot. Um, and again, if we're healthy, usually at one or two a night. As you go to sleep and change sleep staging, your contr sleep controls change. The central chemoreceptor is what's driving things almost all the time, looks at the CO2, and your peripherals and the aortic carotid bodies will look at CO2s and O2, but they're a backup. When you get into REM sleep, this, is pr this was primary, it kind of changes, and this gets less uh, in control, and it's more the peripherals. So that's why in your normal people, when you get in REM sleep, the breathing is very irregular, and sometimes you'll have centrals when you're changing sleep stages, um, so, and that's pretty normal. It's when some of these other patients that this is kind of hyper and driving their CO2 way too low, they actually sometimes get better in REM because this isn't in control. And so, and it's all about CO2. Um, and if this is our, you know, your normal level is right in here and somewhere in here, if you hit that level, the brain's gonna go, what are you doing, quit breathing? Um, and that's these kind of patients that are these treatment emergent central apneas, their normal CO2s might be right in this low side. So you put them on a CPAP, opens the airway a little bit, blows the CO2 in a little bit, and then brain goes, oh, what are you doing? Quit breathing. So then they start having these centrals and they're cyclic. And, uh, and so that's really the mechanism. Um, unstable ventilatory control. And they can classify central apnea, put them in like two groups, compared to what is their CO2 in the day. Uh, this kind of group, normal CO2s are on the low side of normal. Um, and that's the chain stokes and the complex sleep apnea. Um, and this group where they have something wrong with the brain and they're having centrals, but they have high CO2s. Um, different treatment form. This group would be an ASV, adaptive cerebral ventilation to stabilize the ventilation. Uh, this one, they need more. They probably need a bilevel or a ventilator to actually ventilate them because their CO2s are high. Um, interesting numbers. Um, the prevalence, you can see different. You know, I, I seen the Mayo that does a lot and their prevalence they saw, thought was 11% of all their sleep patients. These numbers, this one, um, six and a half percent. This is a huge population, the, the pain management patients, opiates, because the drugs um, will actually knock out their respiratory driver or, or maybe knock it out, but just compromise it. And then if they take them by, by pill, when they go to sleep, take them at 10 o'clock at night, and their response may be different compared to four in the morning when they've worn off. So um, that's a challenge sometimes to get them covered or get them treated. Um, and then the ejection fraction, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. These people with ejection fraction 45% or greater, those are great candidates for an ASV, and about a third of them have central sleep apnea. It is interesting, more prevalent in older individuals, and I thought this was interesting, definitely more prevalent in men, rare in premenopausal women. Overall prevalence is like 0.3% compared to eight, almost 8%. Um, and it is interesting, it has something to do with hormones. I don't know if they can prove anything yet, but I do know there's some um, polycystic ovary syndrome in women that has to do some of the symptoms. They have more testosterone, and they actually have central apneas um, more. And so it may be something to do with hormones. Um, and then the devices, US, there's only two. This is our Restmed, there's a Respironics machine, and it's approved 
Obstructus is the FDA, OSA, central mix apnea is periodic breathing. Um, and the contraindication now from the study we had done, um, heart failure patients with this ejection fraction of 45% or below is contraindicated with this machine. And I believe, they're not sure what the mechanisms are, but it does a great job of eliminating chain Stokes respirations. And that may be a protective mechanism when their heart is that weak. And so if you put them on the machine, that takes it away. And that may be why in the study there was like 2.5% more mortality on the people on the machine. But that's the rules now on either machine. It's contraindicated for that. So how does it work? And this is, this is specifically our algorithm. Um, it's basically you have a CPAP and a, um, and a, a